Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We have four speakers today. Our first speaker is Dr. Paris Klein. Dr. Klein graduated from Tuskegee University College of Veterinary Medicine in 2009. She worked in private practice before joining USDA FSIS in 2016. Dr. Klein has held various positions with FSIS in the field. She is currently a veterinary medical officer in the Office of Field Operations, Regulatory Operations. Dr. Gabriel Eddings graduated from Washington State University College of Veterinary Medicine in 2015. She has worked with USDA FSIS since 2011, beginning her career as a veterinary intern. She continued her career with the public health agency following veterinary school. Dr. Eddings has held various um, positions with FSIS in the field, and she is currently a veterinary medical officer in the Office of Field Operations, Regulatory Operations. Dr. John Zach is a 1997 graduate of the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine. John was a, yard, a large animal and equine practitioner before joining the Animal Health and Plant Inspection Service, Veterinary Services in 2002. He has served as district veterinary medical officer and area veterinarian in charge, and is currently the director of the National Preparedness and Incident Coordination Center. His preparedness activities include the secure food supply plans and the foreign animal disease preparedness and response plan. His response activities include exotic Newcastle disease, contagious equine metritis, melamine, low path avian influenza, high path avian influenza, and New World Screwworm. Our last speaker is Dr. Benjamin, Linda Benjamin. She's a supervisory chemist and team leader for the animal food safety team within the Division of Animal Feeds at FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Benjamin received her BS in chemistry from Rowan University and her MS and PhD in organic chemistry from Drexel University. Dr. Benjamin has been with FDA for 18 years and has led the animal food safety team for the past five years. And with that, I'm going to turn the uh, webinar over to Dr. Parrish Klein. All right, thank you. Well, I'm Dr. Klein. Dr. Eddings and I will be talking to you today about the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Services role in foreign animal disease identification. The Food Safety and Inspection Service, or FSIS, is broken into multiple program areas. Within FSIS, we are from the Office of Field Operations, or OFO. OFO is involved in the day-to-day -day operations in establishments. So first, I'm going to give you a little background about us and what we do. We are the public health agency in the USDA that is responsible for ensuring that meat, poultry, and processed egg products are safe, wholesome, and accurately labeled. Our authority is derived from a series of acts of Congress, most notably the Federal Meat Inspection Act, the Poultry Products Inspection Act, and the Egg Products Inspection Act. FSIS also achieves other important goals, including assuring that animals are humanely handled at slaughter, ensuring regulated products are properly packaged and labeled, and also reducing the harm associated with allergens such as egg, soy, milk, peanuts, tree nuts, fish and shellfish, mislabeled products, illegal chemical residues, and foreign matter entering, the, entering food during production. OFO verifies food safety by enforcing FSIS regulations and policies. We cover approximately 6,500 establishments and 130 import inspection houses across the nation. Our implant personnel with the Office of Field Operations provide continuous inspection of slaughter. That's 100% of livestock receive antemortem and postmortem, 100% of poultry receive postmortem inspection. There's inspection of meat, poultry, and egg processing every shift, and 100% reinspection of imported products. Throughout these establishments, we have a large workforce consisting of approximately 2,400 food inspectors performing carcass by carcass, egg, and import inspection, approximately 3,800 consumer safety inspectors, 750 public health veterinarians, 
and 130 enforcement investigation and analysis officers. Together, they ensure over 127 billion pounds of meat, poultry, and egg products are safe, wholesome, and properly labeled. FSIL field personnel in a slaughter facility, specifically public health veterinarians, consumer safety inspectors, and food inspectors, play a valuable role in detecting reportable and foreign animal diseases. They are at the place in the food animal chain in which they are the ones that will observe clinical signs on any mortem and are often the first to encounter a disease process. Whether the lesions or clinical signs are seen on any mortem or postmortem inspection, the public health veterinarian will examine the animal or carcass in question. If our veterinarians suspect the clinical signs with or without history of the animal or herd, are compatible with a foreign animal disease differential diagnosis, we will report through the chain of command to the APHIS area veterinarian in charge and or state animal health official, following the guidance provided in FSIS Directive 6000.1 Revision 1. It is important that suspicious signs of a foreign animal disease are promptly reported for early detection of foreign animal disease outbreaks. So as Dr. Klein mentioned, uh, as indicated on the previous slide, FSIS implant personnel, especially the veterinarians, have a valuable role in detecting reportable and foreign animal diseases. Official establishments regulated by FSIS must comply with regulatory requirements to assist implant personnel to ensure compliance with those requirements. Directives are maintained and issued by the agency. Directives provide FSIS, OFO, implant personnel with guidance for all types of scenarios. Highlighted in this slide specifically is FSIS Directive 6000.1 Revision 1, which Dr. Klein mentioned. This directive titled Responsibilities Related to Foreign Animal Diseases and Reportable Conditions. Um, as the primary topic of this presentation, um, FIED's identification, we wanted to highlight the guidance and instruction provided to our implant veterinarians on a daily basis. Key points in this directive are twofold. It reiterates notable clinical signs exhibited with FADs, foreign animal diseases, and reportable conditions. It also provides public health veterinarians um, what their role is and responsibilities when he or she has observed compatible clinical signs on anamortem and or compatible pathology on postmortem inspection for any FAD or reportable condition as a differential diagnosis. Moving on, um, Directive 6000.1 does reiterate that implant veterinarians um, can have access to potentially key clinical histories that may prompt them to consider an FAD or reportable condition as a differential diagnosis. History of a lot or herd is something that is not always provided to FSIS at the time of anamortem inspection, but if there is a scenario in which an establishment shares history that was provided by the producer, the veterinarian would focus on key clinical history such as high morbidity, high mortality, a severe abortion storm of unknown etiology, and a history of foreign travel of employees involved with production, just to note some. Clinical history such as these, especially in conjunction um, with clinical signs, such as vesicular lesions, acute onset lameness, um, severe respiratory distress, CNS signs, et cetera, would prompt a veterinarian to consider a foreign animal disease as a differential. Again, clinical history is not always available, but the observations of clinical signs on anamortem will always be available for a veterinarian to assess. In line with the guidance and the directive, if FSIS veterinarian suspects an FAD or reportable condition on anamortem inspection, he or she will U.S. suspect or U.S. condemn the animal per regulatory requirements. Then at this point, he or she will contact their supervisor um, through the supervisory chain of command to the district office, and then APHIS will be informed. It's important to note that communication is rapid and timely. At the same time, FSIS will continue communication with the firm, indicating which potential animals and or lots 
are you a suspect or you have condemned? And potentially if any lot or lots may need to be held from slaughter until information is relayed from APHIS and or the state animal health officials. And then before we go any further into logistics or procedures, we just wanted to ensure everyone has provided information with anamortem inspection and FSIS's role with that inspection at official establishments. So the regulations um, allowing us for anamortem are 9 CFRs Part 309. And this regulatory requirement for FSIS is to observe the overall condition of each animal, and that pertains to the degree of alertness, mobility, breathing, and whether any other abnormalities are noted. It is important to understand that anamortem inspection is performed on the day of slaughter and on every animal. So every animal must receive anamortem inspection. As it mentions on this slide, all livestock are presented for anamortem inspection and observed on anamortem inspection by SSIS personnel. All livestock are observed at rest and in motion. You can have more details about this on the directive listed on this slide. That's FSIS Directive 6100.1 Revision 2. So in regards to African swine fever, um, we provided these pictures. These could be potential clinical signs that an animal presents with where a veterinarian may consider a foreign animal disease as a differential. Uh, these are not limited to African swine fever and are certainly not all inclusive but these are something that would prompt a veterinarian to consider that differential. Those, um, those involved might be, the animal might be weak and present with fever. They might have red areas on the skin. They might have dark purple on the ears, tails, and extremities, um, even the hands. Uh, they may present with diarrhea, or they might have necrotic skin lesions. And then going into postmortem, if an animal is a U.S. suspect, that animal will be, will be slaughtered as such. If an animal is identified as a U.S. suspect, that animal is slaughtered as a suspect, and the carcass and all associated parts is retained by FSIS for veterinary disposition. The establishments assist with this, and there's communication throughout the process with the establishment and FSIS. We did include this information because there are key postmortem pathological findings on postmortem, especially in conjunction with anamortem findings that are even more suggestive of a foreign animal disease or a reportable condition, such as hemorrhagic septicemia. It is also important to understand that not every reportable condition may solely be identified on anamortem findings alone. There are times that postmortem findings are crucial to the case. An example of this might be poor sinusitis or cirrhosis. Um, not a foreign animal disease, but something that you can only um, be sure about on postmortem um, through sampling afterwards. But the pictures on this slide exhibit pathology that can be associated with African swine fever. Again, not limited to or not inclusive, but something uh, to prompt that differential. It's something important to note that African swine fever does not pose a risk to human health or food safety. As a public health agency, we just wanted to be ensure that we reiterated that. However, with that said, FSIS will ensure suspect carcass or carcasses are held at the establishment pending sampling results to determine um, how to go further with the case. Um, sample results to be, or to be collected are determined by APHIS and or the state animal health official. Um, retained carcasses will either be released or condemned following receipt of those sampling results. So how does it get reported? That's kind of a question that a lot of people will ask. If the FSIS veterinarian suspects a foreign animal disease at anamortem inspection or postmortem inspection as we presented in the last slide, but most likely anamortem inspection, FSIS will begin communications through an established reporting system. This system starts by following their supervisory chain of command to inform the district office, and then the district office will contact APHIS, and this is usually the area veterinary in charge and or the state animal health official. Again, this reporting is occurring as soon as the FAD is suspected by the FSIS veterinarian at the establishment. 
The SSIS veterinarian will also communicate with the establishment to obtain information about the lot, such as the producer's name, contact information, and address. The veterinarian will ensure this information along with the clinical history if it was provided to them, the clinical signs observed on animal inspection, the number of species and the animals affected that were presented, et cetera, will go to the district office for reporting. So then what's next? after it's reported. Once the case is reported to the district office and then to APHIS, the area veterinarian charge and or the state animal health official, he or she will determine how the case will be handled. This will include coordinating sample collection and further investigation. The AVEC or state animal health official will provide the district office with specific instructions at the time. FSIS will continue communication through this process with APHIS and the state animal health official. FSIS will ensure suspect carcass or carcasses are held at the establishment pending sample results. Carcass will either be released or condemned following the receipt of sample results that come from APHIS and or the state animal health official. Again, we will also continue communication with the establishment throughout this process. And FSIS, we would just like to thank you for the opportunity to present today. All right, good afternoon. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit here and start talking about animal food and African swine fever. And what we'll do is we'll go through a little bit about how animal food is regulated and then some of FDA's activities related to African swine fever. And I thought I would start by introducing folks to the Center of Veterinary Medicine. So the Center of Veterinary Medicine is one of the smallest centers in the Food and Drug Administration, but we regulate a very broad range of products. We do anything from animal food to drugs that go into animal food, as well as cloning. While the FDA centers typically handle one species, humans, the Center of Veterinary Medicine handles feed for multiple species. And you can see here from the pictures, we look at livestock feed as well as uh, companion animals. And the one unique thing about our environment is the personnel that work there. So we have folks that have uh, degrees in their veterinarians, we have animal scientists, microbiologists, chemists, epidemiologists, and each one bring the different expertise to projects. And we have found that that's been invaluable in our work now with African swine fever. So what is our mission? Well, CVM's mission is to protect human and animal health. And we do that by ensuring a safe animal food supply. And for those of you who aren't familiar with CVM, you may be thinking, okay, if this makes sense, you're protecting animal health, but how are you protecting human health? Well, many of the animals that we regulate are food producing animals, and these are the animals from which you get your meat, milk, and eggs. So a lot of times people say you are what your animal eats or you're exposed to whatever your animal eats. So one of the ways we make sure of ensuring a safe food supply is monitoring and establishing standards for feed contaminants. And not only in the livestock, but in the pet food area. So those contaminants are fairly broad. We look at biological contaminants, whether we're talking pathogens or viruses in this case. We also look at chemical contaminants. Um, chemical contaminants would be things like pesticides, mycotoxins, dioxins. There's a wide range of contaminants. And we also look at physical hazards. In addition to setting standards for contaminants, we're also responsible for approving safe food additives. And what this means is anything that goes into animal feed has to go through a pre-approval process so it gets reviewed and approved before it goes to market and before it can be used in animal feed. 
And you'll see how these two things relate to our work with African swine fever in a couple minutes. We also manage the FDA's medicated feed program and manage FDA's pet food program. How do we do that? Well, this is a little bit of um, just a snapshot of some of the existing laws and regulations that we have that provide us with the foundation of regulating animal feed. Um, most of these regulations have existed for some time, um, obviously starting back in 1906 with the um, Pure Food and Drug Act. But more recently, we have the preventive controls for animal foods in 2015. And this preventive control for animal food is how we have implemented FSMA. And FSMA was signed into law in 2011. And FSMA was new for us and brought a new paradigm to the agency, where in the past we responded to contaminants or food safety hazards. FSMA now turned things around and put in process a way of trying to prevent these hazards. And how are we doing that? So we have well, we'll start with African swine fever and animal food and talk about how these tools help us. So USDA is the primary US government agency with regulatory authority over um, African swine fever, any food, um, um, excuse me, I forgot the word that I want. So for any foreign animal disease, if uh, USDA is the lead agency. Where FDA is gonna have a role is if it is spread through animal food. And the way that it would be spread through animal food is gonna be more through contamination of an object. So if farm equipment got contaminated with the virus and animal feed touched that farm equipment, it could spread that way. We are also looking at transportation vehicles. If that transportation vehicle happened to handle some ingredient or feed that had the virus, the food could get contaminated again. And the same thing with any contact with clothing or footwear from someone who may have went onto a farm and came in contact with the virus. So the feed itself could be a carrier, if you will, for the virus. So what are we doing? What are our authorities to address the virus in, Afri in uh, animal feed? Well, the first thing is looking at mitigants in the animal feed. So this goes back to one of the things that I have mentioned that FDA reviews food additives, make sure additives that go into animal feed is safe. So we would review and approve any potential mitigant that would go into food at go into food as a food additive. And it's possible it could be a veterinary drug too. What we wouldn't be involved with is if this was a vaccine. And then now going back to FSMA, as I said, this preventative control allows is a way of preventing a hazard to begin with. And how does that do that? Well, this allows manufacturers now, they would need to think about the food that they're manufacturing, in this case, a swine feed, and consider the hazards that are in that food, whether that food is a biological hazard, including viruses, and determine if they need to control that hazard. And then they also have to think about what that control would be. And that could be something like a process control, whether something like time, temperature, a kill step would um, impact that particular hazard. If it's a sanitation control, the way you're handling your ingredients or food to, again, prevent that hazard from occurring, or supply chain control. And by supply chain control, gave you an example down here of thinking about swine food. So swine food is made up of many different ingredients. And what the farmer needs to do, or the feed mill that's making the feed, 
they have to think about the source of these ingredients, whether they're raw materials or some kind of process ingredient. So the first thing they would need to think about in their food safety plan under their preventative control regulation is they need to think about, is this ingredient coming from possibly a African swine fever positive country? And if it is, what kinds of checks and balances are in place to make sure that the virus isn't coming with that ingredient. The other thing that we've talked about in some of the uh, earlier talks is these raw materials, are they potentially coming from a packer or a rendering industry? And again, if they are, the feed manufacturer and or the farmer who's ever making the finished feed product just needs to know what their supplier, what their checks and balances are that they have in place for this to prevent the spread of African swine fever. And I do have just a couple little labels here for you. So these are just examples that were just out on the internet. And I cut the names off because it, it um, I just wanted to focus on mostly the ingredients here. So you can see up here on this particular example, there's crude protein, there's crude fat here. It also talks about the addition of animal fat and animal protein products. So there are many other ingredients in here. And this is the stuff in the preventative control rule for folks to look at and say, where are all my ingredients coming from? And what processes do my suppliers have in place so I can be assured that the feed that I am making does not have the virus in it? Now, what is FDA's activities associated with African swine fever? Most of our activities at this point is um, communication and collaboration. And we are working with um, other regulatory agencies, whether that is federal agencies, state agencies. We're working with the feed industry itself and involved with a feed risk task force. The other thing we're actively doing is we're thinking about biosecurity on the farm. And again, our optics basically go to the feed. So we have put out a uh, field bulletin and this field bulletin is for our investigators, for when an investigator steps on a farm to be aware of African swine fever and to think about everything that they do. They need to, it will lay out who they need to contact, what kind of clothing they need to wear before they go onto the farm, what they do with that clothing when they come off the farm, to think about where are you going next? What are you doing your next inspection? Because one of the things we did say earlier is that you can also spread the virus through clothing and shoes. So this uh, field bulletin basically addresses all those biosecurity um, considerations for our investigator to make sure they do not spread the virus from one farm to another. The other thing we've been looking at is a response plan. And in the response plan, we have two main objectives here. And again, our objective is to look at the food only, not, the, not to the animal. So we would look and see in the response plan, it basically goes through and identifies the resources that we may need. What are the critical activities for us to detect, respond to, contain, and prevent the further spread of the virus through animal food? And what will we have to do um, if, for example, the food was contaminated, what would we have to do to help that supply chain stand back up quickly? So to facilitate a swift normalization of and distribution of animal food. And the response plan, as I said, it is directed mostly to FDA and again to our internal resources, but it spells out our authorities and roles. So our investigators know what is our authority, what is our role, where they should be working with USDA and or the state. And then also what are the resources needed to respond to an outbreak. And by resources, we even go down through what type of um, 
Tyvek suits do they need? What type of PPE do they need? So this is all kinds of resources that an investigator may need to respond to it. And we also talk a little bit about communication in here because this was built using the principles of incident management. So it goes through that whole more formal process of who is in control and then what do we set up and who sends out messaging within there. So just going one step further with the response plan, the key strategies to, up, to meet the objectives that we set forth is one of them is inspections on an infected farm or feed mill. And again, that this key strategy of an inspection goes to our objective of detecting, responding to, and containing and preventing the further spread. The second one would be conducting a trace forward, trace back investigation on the animal food to figure out where the virus came from. So this would go back to help us facilitate that swift normalization of and distribution of animal food. The other key strategy that we have is we are right now um, working with um, some of our stakeholders to, for reviewing and approving mitigants for against African swine fever. And then the newest thing that we're doing now, we are just starting, uh, we just started a small work group to look at sampling and testing of contaminated animal food. And it's mostly to have that stood up if we would ever need to uh, do that in the future. So again, I'd like to thank you all for inviting FDA to um, present the work that we're doing with African swine fever and animal food. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, this is John Zach with uh, USDA APHIS. I'd like to thank you all for um, joining the webinar today. And beyond that, I want to thank you all for participating in the January um, exercise. Um, these exercises we have learned are become really good, um, safe, collaborative environment for us to test existing policies and procedures. Um, some of the gaps we've identified in the past, we, we try out the, uh, the new uh, fixes, whether they're policy or procedures. And then always we identify uh, new gaps and new challenges that we need to continue um, working on together. I, I think before I launch into ASF response proper, and then move into ASF response, specifically the implications for slaughter establishments. I do want to walk through all the, the projects that have occurred so far in activities and collaborations for African swine fever preparedness. I think some of you probably are involved with these a lot. And even for the people that are involved on this on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, keeping track of everything that's been done, all the collaboration groups, the communication groups, the projects, uh, the plans, procedures, uh, updating uh, how authorities we have may apply. There's, there's been a lot to keep track of. I think the gratifying thing is I can't think, uh, except for high path AI, um, I think even surpassing SMD preparedness, the level of interest from the um, private sector companies, the state, the industry association groups, uh, USDA, the the uh, the other uh, federal agencies, FDA, the um, our sister USDA agency FSIS, the level of interest in preparing and and you know, for African swine fever has been good. I know it's been frustrating because from a planning perspective, we have not had an ASF outbreak ever. In the United States, 
We also have not had a large multi-state barn animal disease outbreak in the swine sector. Um, you know, the, the last thing that's even comparable is the Sioux Radius eradication, and that's entirely different because it was a endemic disease um, that was eradicated versus the introduction of a foreign animal disease. But we really want to make hay with all the interest and collaboration of all the parties. Um, and again, this exercise specifically related to um, slaughter establishments, we really um, want to thank you all again for your continued interest um, in working together. Um, just, you know, I'm just going to quickly go through um, a, a big reminder is that in 2019, uh, the African swine fever, classical swine fever, integrative active surveillance program was implemented. The key thing here was that African swine fever was basically added to the existing classical swine fever um, active surveillance program. And this was rolled out in 2019. The goal is for 15,000 plus targeted African swine fever, classical swine fever samples per year. And again, I think this was a significant milestone because this is again a safety net to help us identify African swine fever and classical swine fever. If it is introduced into the country, if it is missed as a foreign animal disease type investigation and um, for the different targeted surveillance streams that can you know, be basically Practitioners can identify these, non-labs can identify these. Again, it's, it's not a huge number of samples that we would need in the event of an outbreak, but as background surveillance in terms of a net safety net to help for early detection, this was a significant milestone. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is on the USDA side, uh, in addition, we know the industry association groups, private companies, um, are doing a lot of type of analytical work, assessment work on the risk of African swine fever. In 2019, um, APHIS published these, and these are available on, a, um, on the APHIS website. And basically, uh, you know, qualitative assessment of the likelihood of, of ASF virus entry into the United States, uh, non-animal origin feed ingredient risk evaluation framework. We know that work continues on with collaboration. Um, and then a literature review of non-animal origin, origin feed ingredients and the transmission of viral pathogens of swine. Again, a lot of this is related to the, the safeguarding of keeping the African swine um, fever virus uh, out of the country. Um, uh, next, uh, I think that the, many of you probably participated, again, thank you, in the four African swine fever exercises that were conducted in 2019. They began in November 2019 with a policy exercise, followed up with an exercise to assess existing ASF response plan, followed up in April with the spring fever exercise, so basically was uh, preparing for the four-day functional exercise. And that four-day functional exercise occurred in September of 2019 um, the cute name sphere. Um, and again, the 14 leading swine um, participating states, uh, I think we had over 1920 um, individual swine uh, um, private um, companies engaged, as well as the swine industry association groups. And these first four exercises, um, I think were critical for identifying some policy gaps, as well as procedure gaps and additional gaps um, in our um, uh, ASF uh, planning and um, responding. Um, uh, basically, you know, culminating those uh, four ASF um, exercises and many of the policy questions that came out of this, the USDA secretary and undersecretary at the department level published in um, March of 2020 the USDA ASF action plan. Um, and I think that the key policy thing here that were delineated was that from the USDA planning perspective and policy perspective, if there is a detection of African swine fever in the United States, the USDA plans on declaring an extraordinary emergency. Uh, USDA also plans on 
issuing a national movement standstill of at least 72 hours for live swine and germplasm, uh, using the most uh, efficient and effective AVMA approved depopulation methods. Those would be both euthanasia and depopulation methods. AVMA has guidelines for both. Assistance with herd plan development to deal with carcass disposal um, in line with regional and local and state requirements. And for virus elimination, um, developing a uniform flat rate based on the size of the affected premises using the same policy and methodology that has been adapted for highly pathogenic um, avian influenza. Um, I got a I got a question to the um, host presenter. I can I can no longer there. Here we go. Thank you. I was having a problem advancing my slides, but now I can do it. Following the uh, the action plan published by the department, the secretary and the undersecretary, um, basically, you know, to delineate those policies, the first USDA APHIS African Swine Fever Red Book. Um, was published in April of 2020. And this identified specific response actions, um, updates the movement standstill guidance, um, includes the current update to our surveillance guidance, incorporated uh, the need for, the dire need for immediate contact tracing in the context of looking at network-based controls for dangerous direct contacts to infected premises. Um, I know the term network-based controls, people are puzzled by it, don't be. It really is going back to the tried and true traditional, you know, epidemiology 101, disease outbreak 101, contact tracing. We know that we have an infected prem. Um, we always talk a good game about contact tracing, but looking at the way the swine industry is set up, the way this particular virus moves, it's long incubation period that we really need to put a resource emphasis on contact tracing um, as, a, as a primary need of combating this virus and trying to get ahead of this virus instead of chasing it. And as you all know, very well know, your contract contact tracing effort, efforts are best suited and most efficient, most effective, the biggest payoff is when you have uh, smaller numbers of infected premises that you have some hope of the contact tracing, you know, um, helping you catch up and find diseases that are infected but not detected before they have clinical signs um, in the herd that you find them 20, 24 days later. So I think that from the, the state animal health official um, perspective, from the VS perspective, if the term network-based controls you don't like, just think of it as an emphasis on contact tracing. Um, the other thing that's going on is the many ongoing working and communication groups. Um, I just have a parcel list here on this slide. I, I, I think it's critical that you know, there's a lot of efforts going on. Like my own shop, we have several, you know, um, projects with states and groups that aren't listed here. I'm sure for many of you, there's other projects and um, working and communication groups ongoing. And I don't want to slight anyone, but I, I think that some of the ones listed here are the, the primary ones you may be aware of, the NASAHO State Veterinarian Working Group, in conjunction with that, Dr. Meckes and Dr. Nault, North Carolina. Um, lead a communication call. Um, I know that some calls uh, are, are opened up to the industry association groups and APHIS officials as well. We, we really thank them for that. That's been a great way to communicate uh, on developing policy and procedures. Um, we also want to thank uh, North Carolina for coordinating the COVID-19 calls during the whole swine slaughter establishment um, slowdown. Um, due to the decreased slaughter capacity. Um, we're going to talk directly later in this talk about some of the lessons learned from the COVID-19 response related to slaughter establishments. Um, 
In addition, the swine industry association groups, such as the National Pork Board and the uh, NPPC and others, state groups, um, having ongoing working groups and communication groups. Dr. Shear leads the uh, ASF technical working group with um, some members of the state and the industry. In addition, our diagnostics and biologics and SEA group are leading a host of diagnostics and surveillance um, technical um, type work. Um, specific laboratory updates for ASF preparedness. The NAL now, I believe this number may have changed a little bit, but it's up to 47 laboratories where they can run 40,000 ASF PCR tests a day, total capacity. With the pooling methodology they have now validated, that can reflect, I think, currently up to 200,000 animals a day. Um, we get asked a lot about what is surge capacity. What, you know, right now, uh, I would say at the start of an outbreak, the, the capacity to collect the samples is probably a bigger, bigger bottleneck than actually, you know, getting 40,000 samples rep representing 200,000 samples um, ran in a day. But again, if you have a large scale national outbreak, we talk about the priorities for diagnostics. The addition of this additional diagnostics, such as the oral fluid um, um, diagnostic sampling and other things. Um, in addition, the NALM and FADL are working on controls, reagents, and the consumables availability. Another lesson learned from other disease outbreaks in COVID-19 is uh, your reagent supply, all your testing supplies, whether it's the, everything from the swabs, the kits. I think fortunately, um, you know, this is pretty old school, a lot of the testing we're doing so far, which would be, you know, existing things such as red top, green top, uh, um, swirl bags or Ziploc bags, and then um, oral fluid um, testing as it's added in the future. Um, different sample types are being evaluated and, evalu um, and evaluated for validation, um, such as whole blood, different types of uh, methodologies for collecting tonsil, spleen, uh, lymph node. I think also on the um, rectal swabs has been added to the list. Um, and then finally, I know which a lot of you are interested in is the oral fluid um, under evaluation, how that can be worked into um, the, 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 the active surveillance as well as passive surveillance in an ASF outbreak. Um, again, you know, the keeping the ASF virus out of the country, um, ongoing collaborations with Custom and Border Protection, um, regular communication to them. Uh, you know, I think the number of beagles was added, you know, a year or two ago, um, which was great. You know, rely on the dog nose to help find the, uh, the commodities that, you know, uncooked sausage and things could be a risk in our country. Um, also, ongoing bilateral communications with Canada on how we would manage an ASF detection in either or both countries for restoring not only the um, trade of pork, but also the live animal swine trade that occurs between the two countries and also international services uh, learning from other countries what the African swine fever situation is in their countries and how they are responding to it. Again, you know, a, a, a lot of a lot of work is is going on right now under you know the different broad categories of surveillance and diagnostics, information management, specifically working with collaborative efforts with states and third parties, such as. Um, Ag use some private sector companies on how we can share movement data, um, laboratory initial response. I can report that now the appraisal and then the request form, the herd owner template, and the ASF epidemiology questionnaire are all um, completed and up on the um, Fab Prep website. In addition, work on the virus elimination in terms of, you know, what how clean is clean and um, what is the flat rate compensation for infected premises that USDA will do a cost share? And then obviously the very difficult problem of depopulation and carcass disposal for any animals that would need to be um, disposed of, depopulated and disposed on farm. The other long-term activity that's been going on 
is, you know, under the category of continuity of business, the secure port supply plan, um, the National Port Board, NTPC, Iowa State University, ACES, state, individual private sector companies, uh, you know, other, other folks, a big tent have been involved in working on, um, again, you know, learning from what was developed for the avian um, sector, what could be developed for the port sector in terms of once the disease outbreak comes, how can you elevate biosecurity, what biosecurity is actually functional that can be worked, is going to be needed. In addition to that, an eye toward managing the movement of the non-infected premises that can be demonstrated in a control area, you know, moving um, uh, that product to slaughter or those animals for further uh, finishing. Um, uh, the, the, the key thing here, I think, is that uh, uh, there's, if, you have, if you haven't been on the, the Secure Port Supply Plan, I would say check it out. A lot of great work has been done on the, on the biosecurity end on walking through the different types of facilities, the different types of biosecurity that's needed. Um, I think the one question that we're all working on are what are the actual requirements for a permit? And I know that some of the technical working groups are working on that with state official um, involvement. The state officials group itself is working hard in that question. And I think a lot of it depends upon um, the diagnostics that we have now versus the diagnostics we may add. Um, but I think the key thing here is that everyone has an eye on the problem of once we're in an outbreak, you know, how are we going to move animals to slaughter, animals to finishing, just the broad nature of the, um, the, the port sector in terms of its reliance upon transportation and that mass movement um, every day. Um, the other uh, programs in development is uh, feral swine surveillance, further developing that um, on the APHIS side with wildlife services. And then finally, probably many of you are aware of the uh, the new initiative or newer initiative to develop a swine health improvement program, which is an MP, MPI, MPIP-like program that will include the day-to-day -day surveillance and biosecurity um, program for the swine industry to um, develop with APHIS and the state. And that I think that Dr. Roger Main has said that this is going to be uh, a like the NPIP day to day. And then the way it fits with the secure port supply plan is the secure port supply plan is the methodology for, the more specific methodology for elevating biosecurity um, at the actual um, start of an outbreak. Others may have a different characterization of that, but I think the important point is that this is a, a development of a broader umbrella for the swine industry under which other components and processes underway will um, nicely fit. Now I'm going to pivot toward, um, you know, that, that seems like that was a lot of slides just to go through all the current activities. Um, I think now I'm going to pivot to actual ASF response. I think a key, you know, elevator speech, fully pulpit speech, something we have to just keep talking to each other is that any ASF response is going to, any success is going to rely upon the industry and the private sector, as well as state government, as well as federal government, all have to own the, own the um, outbreak, own the response, and work together. Not one group can do this alone. You know, we, we need each other and the collaborations and, you know, solving as many problems as we can ahead of the outbreak is key. We've learned that from other outbreaks. And we know that the any ASF outbreak is going to be, again, we, ha we haven't dealt with it in the past. We don't have a lot of uh, referential experience for how to handle it here in the United States. Um, we do have experience working on other emergencies. So the best processes and um, methodologies that have worked there, 
we want to carry over to um, ASF preparedness. And again, I think we just have to go into it with an understanding that, you know, the private sector companies are going to have to, you know, you know the solutions that they need to adapt, develop, and implement themselves. We need to collaborate and co um, communicate on, but everybody um, has an important role. The other thing I would say for ASF response, um, you know, looking at it from a high level, is that, you know, we have plans and we have policies, goals, strategies, you know, what I would say fall under plans. Then you have your actual capabilities um, to implement plans. And that is, you know, your organizations, your personnel, your capacities, the tools you have um, under the broad category of capabilities. Uh, where we usually run into trouble with capabilities is sometimes we don't have all the tools that we want and that we have limited personnel or that we have never come together to work together on a response so that when you put plans and capabilities together, the real um, proof of action, course of action, is what you can actually conduct in the field. Um, your field actions. And again, the field actions will be conducted by state personnel, federal personnel, the private sector companies, and the industry association groups. And all those things together um, become your operations. And again, if we've never done an ASF response together, and this is, you know, you know, for every, every part of the sector, if you're talking about a, a sow production facility, you're talking about a finisher facility, I think now we're wisely moving into slaughter establishments. Each each um, uh, premises has its own unique challenges that we need to address. And you know, again, as you look at this, this is just one way of uh, assessing it. But where where are the plans? You know, policy goal strategies good? Where are there gaps? For the organization personnel readiness tools. You know, where are you good to go? Where are the gaps? And then finally, you know, putting it all together for field actions and probably the only, you know, the only real way to test field actions are through exercises or real world events such as like the COVID-19 um, event. The other thing to keep in mind with any disease response is the competing interests that we have to de-conflict such as disease control versus continuity of business. More specifically, um, you can call that how do you manage the infected premises versus managing the non-infected premises, and then balancing interstate commerce, interstate commerce, and international trade. As we talk about ASF, you know, we need to remind ourselves what the virus is and what the virus isn't. Now, I'm speaking from, you know, the lowly animal health regulatory official um, position. We need the, the, the human uh, public health specialists, the medical doctors, uh, FDA, FSIS, all those folks um, tasked with uh, human um, health and safety and public health to carry this message with us and for us. But I will report that, you know, from my perspective, from I think APHIS perspective, ASF is not a zoonotic disease. ASF itself is not a food safety issue. Um, ASF virus transmission occurs in direct contact between pigs. Um, secretions from pigs are all um, infectious, contagious, but especially blood. If you look at a lot of literature, um, you know, on my staff, folks have pulled together a literature search um, you'll see, uh, you know, different uh, ranges on uh, how long uh, the infectivity is in feces, urine, blood. It seems like in the literature search, blood is a consistent higher risk for um, the lateral transmi transmission opportunities, as well as, uh, you know, um, contaminated um, pork products or the actual carcasses themselves. Um, so that's something we got to keep in mind is what is the lateral transmission opportunities 
uh, for this virus? How do we rank them in terms of risk? In addition to, you know, obviously the direct contact between um, infected pigs. And pigs. Um, the other way this virus is spread is through the ingestion of contaminated products by pigs. Um, you know, the swill waste, the swill or garbage feeding. Um, and then, um, particularly for the wild boar in Europe, um, the, the wild boar there, they burrow in the ground. There's a particular type of soft pick that this virus can live in. It can transmit generationally in the tick. And then that can be a reservoir um, for vector to maintain an outbreak, um, particularly in the wild boar. There is some concern about our feral swine in this country. I think our wildlife services experts and the, um, our, our tick experts can help us evaluate this risk. I think the good news is that the feral pigs here in our country don't, I guess, evidently don't burrow like the wild boar in Europe, but we do have to keep that tick vector in mind as well. Um, you're going to you're going to have a lot of different information about ASF virus and activation. I just quickly pulled what you know is, is a good standard to start with, which is the OIE technical card. Um, in terms of what is the recommendation for temperature, pH, you know, chemical disinfectants and survival. Uh, here at USDA, this, the EPA approved disinfectants, both the commercial disinfectants now, the ones that the EPA has given a, a FIFRA Section 18 exemption for, such as like citric acid or bleach. We have those up on our website. I think when we're talking about a slaughter establishment, I think we really need to look at, you know, they are experts at cleaning the interior of their facilities related to a whole host of pathogens, a whole host of viruses and bacteria. Um, and I would argue that, you know, we, we need to look at the existing cleaning procedures and chemicals and disinfectants that they're, you know, um, the, the slaughter establishments are using inside the plants to clean up their areas. And we can, you know, we can then recognize, you know, I don't want to come in and say you have to use Vercon S if you're using something that fits the specifications to clean, um, you know, you're on your already regularly scheduled cleaning for the interior um, aspects of your slaughter establishment. Out in the large areas, you may want to, you know, rely upon, um, you know, what is used on the farm. That's more of a farm type situation. And we can certainly assist with the chemicals and disinfectants um, that we recommend use on farms or, you know, where the actual um, pigs are held in large. I think the key thing here is we need to be smart about this virus. You know, it, it, in some ways, it's um, um, a, a tough virus to be nature, but it's not the Andromeda strain virus that, you know, we need to be afraid of. We're intelligent and we can figure out how to be nature of the virus. I think the other thing about ASF that we need to really think hard about is the epidemiology of this virus in particular. This virus has long incubation period, period. And that long incubation period, um, I know that there's been great work done by the, you know, the industry association groups, by the swine, our swine staff at VS, <clears throat> by our centers of epidemiology and animal health to really look at, you know, the different types and strains of the AS virus you know, the current world circulating strains, what does that actually look like in um, a United States production facility? You know, if you have finishing pigs, if you have sows, um, how does that virus, you know, move through those pens, houses, barns in terms of, you know, what is the um, uh, infective uh, range of days until you have clinical detection. And I've got to say that, you know, it, 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 it is a challenge for us because the incubation period can be as up to 20, 24 days until you actually have a clinical detection. Now, it can be much earlier than that. It can be as soon as five days. And if you add diagnostics to it, we may be able to obviously reduce that range of catching it to 20, 24 days. But with the diagnostics that we currently have, 
And even with the addition of oral fluid testing down the road, which we anticipate, the reality is that for African swine fever, a certain percentage of infected but undetected pigs will be potentially moving without permits and or moving with permits, even if the premise is in a control area that you're monitoring. And the so I, what, what I want the folks in the, the slaughter establishment industry sector to think about is that if you've been told, well, if somebody has a biosecurity plan and if somebody has some diagnostic tests, then that herd is uh, guaranteed to be negative, guaranteed to be negative I'm not detected moving to slaughter. And I will tell you that for live swine movement, with the current diagnostics we have now, with even with the addition of, um, I'm, I'm believing, just from what I know, but I'm not the expert, they'll come to us with the information. Even with the addition of oral fluid testing to diagnostics, we are never going to get, drive the risk of infected but undetected pigs moving to zero. So we need to think hard now about the other mitigations to put in place because if a certain percentage of pigs are moving to slaughter that are infected but undetected, and that percentage may range from 17% of the pigs moving, 10%, 5%, 4%, whatever it may be, depending upon how effective the biosecurity um, has been in place on a, 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 a production site, how long they've been isolated, what the pre-movement isolation period protocol was, if you've actually been able to do contact tracing to demonstrate they're not associated with an infected prem. I mean, there's a lot of factors into what determines if something is infected but undetected prior to moving. The other thing that we know historically is that for our foreign animal disease investigations, like let's talk SDA, for fiscal year 2020, we had over 3,000 um, foreign animal disease investigations. The vast majority were for SDA, forget the exact number, but you know over 2,000 of them were for SDA, and I believe 80, 90% of those were detected at slaughter establishments. So if you're in the slaughter sector industry, if you own a slaughter establishment, that's where you work. I think you need to think about, yeah, it would be great if we never had infected but undetected pigs come to our premises. But I think we need to think more broadly about how do we mitigate the risk of infected but undetected pigs moving to slaughter establishments? And then how do we manage infected pigs that are detected at slaughter establishments. Now getting into ASF, you know, um, response proper, uh, USDA secretary um, has broad um, authorities for foreign animal disease response. Um, when we actually have an investigation, uh, we work closely with the states and the private companies involved during that investigation period. Once we have a presumptive positive at the non-lab, um, if that's the case, you know, we work through our foreign animal disease investigation protocols and procedures with the states and the private sector company. Um, once we actually have a confirmed uh, um, sample in NVSL, again, going back to the current secretary and undersecretary stated policy, um, we immediately USDA currently intends immediately declare an extraordinary emergency, issue a national movement standstill for 72 hours, um, authorize the states to begin depopulation of the infected premises. Um, we understand that depopulating um, swine is not gonna be like AI. There is no stated goal of depopulating within 24 hours as we do for HBAI. We understand that depending upon the herd, the location, getting the management team together, getting your disposal plan together, you know, how how that um, 
um, heard that that infected premises is depopulated. You know, you all exercised in fear. You've all had a chance to actually live through it through the COVID-19. So we have to set realistic expectations. Um, again, an emphasis on contact tracing, biosecurity on the infected premise once it's determined. There's, there's additional priorities in addition to the depopulation, the method of depopulation or euthanasia, as well as the, you know, how you do it in terms of, you know, are you going to do a tooth extraction versus are you going to do the infected pens first versus the whole house. Again, a lot of details to, you know, depopulating and disposing an infected premise. But the, the important thing is once we have that confirmation, we'll be working with the states and the companies on that immediately. Again, a huge thing is the coordinated public awareness campaign. Again, from the state side, the private sector company side, the industry association groups, um, APHIS, USDA, you know, the, the coordinated public awareness campaign about what this virus is and isn't, you know, coming out of the human pandemic, particularly where people, you know, you know, some people have paid attention that the COVID virus came out of an animal originally a bat, you know, public messaging here is so critical in terms of what this virus is and isn't in terms of the zoonotic pathogen, not a food safety issue, um, again, we, we, you know, I, I think a lot of great work has been done on the messages ahead of time, but, you know, this is another critical um, activity, our, you know, zero. Um, the national movement standstill is only going to apply to the movement of live sw of swine and germplasm as it's currently um, designed. It's intended to allow states, tribes, and industry time to gather critical information for a unified response. Um, USDA will provide implementation guidance. The uh, goals of the National Movement Standstill or purpose of it, we've been asked a lot about this. So I think some people think that the 72-hour National Movement Standstill is somehow we're going to identify the infected prem, quarantine it, do contact tracing, identify all the other potentially contacted premises, infected premises, and then, so when we end the 72-hour movement standstill, we'll have it all figured out, and um, there won't be any risk of pigs moving, any of them being infected but undetected. That is not the purpose of the 72-hour national movement standstill. If you've ever, if you've ever been in a fight, or if you've ever done any kind of uh, boxing or Muay Thai, if you've ever been punched in the face and been seen a flash, you will know that if you get stunned with a punch. Sometimes it takes a little time to collect yourself. So think of the 72-hour national movement standstill as a standing eight count. And during that standing eight count, we need to communicate both internally and externally the outbreak and immediate actions needed. We need to establish initial control areas, communicate the location of the initial control areas. That is so that, you know, people that process the pigs and produce the pigs actually know what's going on, where are the control areas, what needs a permit, what doesn't need a permit, what is a, a initially a high risk direct contact, what's not. Um, essentially communicate where movement controls and permits are required when the standstill ends, conduct initial high priority contact tracing from infected premises. You know, nationally, if folks have that secure um, port supply plan, some people may be practicing, you know, enhanced biosecurity that is good enough for uh, African swine fever. Some other folks may need to increase the biosecurity at the start of an outbreak, their procedures and processes. Gives people 72 hours to start increasing that. Um, also for folks that, you know, if they have death loss in their herd that's above their normal production parameters, they may want to say, hmm, maybe uh, maybe I need to do a passive surveillance investigation here because my death rate is higher than it is normally. Maybe it would trigger some different thinking there in terms of evaluating um, um, in terms of passive surveillance. And, you know, otherwise, there are, you know, significant international trade consequences for any product 
that requires a USDA or other government certification that the United States is free from ASF. So that is the goals and purpose of the 72-hour um, national movement standstill. Um, you know, based on the exercises that we've done, I think the states and the private sector companies, industry association groups said, we don't want a chaotic, if we're going to do this, we don't want it to be chaotic. We don't want 30 different versions of it or flavors of it. We want one that starts at a known time, ends at a known time. Um, and so here's an example of the language that would, um, you know, possibly be used that, you know, live swine, this only applies to live swine, swine semen or embryos. And very clearly, because we learned this from the exercises, all live swine that are in interstate and interstate commerce at the start of the movement stand still, much reach the destination and not be stopped on the road. Livestock in transit refers to livestock loaded in vehicles that have departed the point of loading or held in a livestock market. Swine arriving to slaughter establishments may be slaughtered provided they pass routine food safety and inspection service and a mortem inspection. Um, the, the one thing that will change dramatically is the live swine and transport to Canada will not be permitted to cross the border and should return to their point of origin. That is what Canada has requested. So if a truck has left your farm and crossed the border into Canada, they're stuck with it. If it hasn't reached the border, it's not going to be crossing the border. Um, and, and then so the, you know, so basically, you know, we want to clearly state what the movement stance will apply to, what it doesn't apply to. And think of it is that, again, we know that there are massive amounts of pigs on the road at any given day or hour, depending upon the day or hour. So when the move, movement stand still comes, anything on the road continues to its destination, or if it can't, it goes back to its origin, or preferably to its destination if it's on, a, on the road. And then, you know, the, the movement stand still, the standing eight count starts um, after, you know, it starts for any additional um, movement of pigs that have not already on the road. Um, we always get questions about that, and it's good to talk through it. Um, then, you know, the next big question is, what happens at hour 73, the magical hour 73? Well, I think there we, we're, we're discussing policy options with the states, with everyone. Um, it seems to me that the logical policy options would be at the end of the 72-hour national movement standstill, premises and free areas re resume interstate commerce of swine and swine germplasm. Um, premise, and this would specifically mean premises that are not in established control areas at hour um, 73. So if you're not in a control area at hour 73, first policy option is that if you, if you want to, um, um, uh, uh, if you want to continue, um, if you want to continue movement or, or move, then you're free to do so. That's one policy option. I just saw a question from Nora Wyland. So the same thing would apply. Pigs in Canada and throughout the United States, if they've crossed the border, they will continue to their destination in the United States. If they have not crossed the border from Canada, they will turn around and go home um, to Canada. I, I, I don't know if that answers your question, Nora, uh, but it would be reciprocal arrangement with Canada. Um, the, other, the second policy option um, would be continue the national movement stand still for an additional period of time beyond hour 73. And I know this is what a lot of people are very worried about. They're like, well, we're talking about a 72 hour national movement stand still. The lessons learned from COVID was if you pile these things up on production sites, we run into problems pretty quickly. Um, so the question would be if you did beyond hour 73, are you talking another 24 hours? or are you talking two weeks? And I think that, you know, depending upon the national situation, never say never, never say always, but that is an option to extend an entire national movement standstill for an additional period of time beyond hour 73. But we all recognize that you're then gonna start a cascade of problems the longer you do that. Um, the other option is to establish a regional or other smaller geographical or jurisdictional movement standstill 
for interstate commerce the hour, beyond hour 73. So for example, you could put a movement standstill on a particular state, or you could put a movement standstill on a group of states and allow the rest of the country to um, call the rest of the country a free area and begin to move um, again. And then finally, you have some variations on that where you may have a state or a group of states where you have defined control areas, but you want to may have some kind of uh, pre-movement testing um, before animals move if they're moving for finishing, or you may allow um, in the in the, a, a particular state or a group of states, you may allow pigs to move to slaughter, but you may not want finishing pigs to move until you have a better idea about the contact tracing or the you know what is the risk of moving uh, infected but undetected finishing pigs around. So then you move into a range of options, everything from you know a full standstill to allowing some pigs to move to slaughter, pigs moving for finishing, depending upon what your criteria is going to be for the size of your control area, and then outside the size of your control area, are you going to put other type of um, pre-movement um, requirements on? So again, these are things that we have not entirely obviously settled, but we're methodically working through what we're going to do from time zero to, to hour 72 and then beyond. And then the, the other final point I'll just make on this is that if you don't do a 72-hour movement stand, so fine. If you don't want the standing eight count, fine. But then you have to deal with all these issues hour zero. So your your burden does not lighten by getting rid of the national movement stand. So and you could argue, was it effective or not? Is it needed or not? And we can certainly, you know, revisit that over, you know, and, you know, change policy as needed. Um, but, you know, my point would be just taking it off the table, then you're just you're putting more um, problems and critical activities that need to be completed all at once at hour zero. Um, another thing we all we got to keep in mind is all our response actions, you know, need to be really targeted science-based actions. You know, the epidemiologic principles of our response is to prevent contact between the ASF virus and swine. You know, we do this with control areas, contact tracing, and biosecurity. Um, we want to stop the production of African swine fever by depopulating the infected swine. Um, as as the situation develops, we, we need to remember the soft tick, soft tick vector, make sure that we're not allowing um, transmission um, that way, and then we have to manage our national um, feral swine um, herd and population as well. These are all kind of unique challenges related to ASF. The primary um, eradication strategy for African swine fever is, um, it, it, and, the, and the strategy, I think my main point is that the, the strategy that we have is for both domestic swine detection and feral swine detection. So for the slaughter establishment company, if you own a slaughter establishment company, you work in a slaughter establishment, if a feral pig is detected with African swine fever, um, if you're in that, is going to trigger your control area. So if you're in that control area, um, you know, you're going to be subject to the same requirements as if it was a domestic swine detection. And the reason for that is that internationally, if we detect ASF in either domestic swine or feral swine, that is a detection for the United States period. There's currently no distinction in terms of international um, bilateral trade consequences to a detection in domestic swine or feral swine. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is there is currently no effective vaccine available for African swine fever. Um, and that we go from zero to 60 miles per hour pretty darn quick in terms of the range of, you know, when you talk about communication, uh, surveillance and diagnostics, contact tracing, um, managing the infected trend. 
managing the control area, managing the surveillance in the control area, managing the surveillance in the free area. Um, you go to zero to 60 on a whole host of critical activities pretty quickly. Again, I'm gonna you know, kind of belabor this. The control and eradication strategy for domestic swine is the establishment of control areas around infected premises. I think the good news here is that internationally and domestically now, and I think even Canada has accepted this, that um, we don't need to have huge control areas. If we need huge control areas, we can use them because the size of the control area should be driven by the, the local risk of the disease. But I think that in valuing ASF in the United States, we need the traditional control area concept. Here it's a five kilometer control area, minimum size, three kilometer infected zone, two kilometer buffer zone. Um, um, but we don't need to start with a 10 kilometer zone and we certainly don't need to start with a whole county or a whole state as a control area. And I think the reason is that the way, again, the pig industry moves, the, in addition to that control area, the pigs that have moved off that premises, the contact tracing, and we know that a lot of these movements are interstate large distances or interstate large distances. Again, the emphasis on not only the control area, but the contact tracing. And you know, here's just the representation of what you know control area can look like. It doesn't have to be the circle. Once upon a time, we couldn't draw circles, so we did the roads. Then now with the computers, you can do circles more easily. It really should be driven by the need. You know, that's what you should drive it, um, the size of the control area. And there's a whole manual written on evaluating the criteria for the size of the control area. The other thing is, again, emphasis on the contact tracing. Um, then again, the same strategy is gonna be used for feral swine. Obviously, the 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 thing the, the the trick here, the thing here is that we all know feral swine aren't owned by anyone. We all know that feral swine, you know, just kind of like don't read laws and authorities and state signs and stop signs, and they tend to ignore fences if they're not strong enough to keep them out. So our wildlife services folks have been working on this very hard. Um, the initial infected zone for a feral swine detection will be big enough to include what they either know to be or estimate to be the home range for the feral pigs. The good news for us is that feral pigs aren't like geese and wild um, um, birds that fly from Alaska down to the Gulf of Mexico. Feral pigs tend to have defined home ranges, and particularly in the United States, some of those home ranges are not very big. So again, we're gonna start out with a reasonable or appropriate size control area based on what wildlife services and state wildlife services officials advise what the home range of those pigs are. We will begin surveillance and eradication of the feral pigs in there. The domestic swine premises in the control area will be subject to surveillance um, and movement and permitting as well. Um, as, as the feral pig detection is evaluated, if we need to expand the control area because there was more, it will do so. Again, wildlife services, and um, APHIS folks are working very hard on the methodology of how to do this, both um, operationally um, as well as you know, from the information management aspects um, related to EMRFs. So again, just to belabor it, control areas for feral swine detection. Again, feral swine management is going to rely hev heavily upon our um, wildlife services experts, both at APHIS at the state level, whether they're in your DNR, Department of Ag, Land. We understand that many states have different rules about who owns or manages feral swine. On the USDA side, you know, we want to again start with state rules and regulations. If they're not strong enough, we'll back them up with ours. Um, getting into you know swine establishments, you know, proper. You know, here's a question: What lessons did we learn from COVID-19 about swine slaughter establishments in relation to? ASF, CSF, FMD response. You know, one answer, which is kind of a well done answer, is if a significant percentage of daily slaughter production is lost, then significant cascade effects on pig production sites. So, more specifically, and then this is just kind of a macro 
you know, thought exercise. So don't get hung up on the numbers. It's the numbers are just here to illustrate a point. But using public data that is, you know, published by, you know, Kearns and Associates, who puts out, you know, amazing information um, about the, the, the slaughter uh, production data in the country, you know, using, um, I don't, this was National Hog Farm or some other magazine, um, you know, taking information they had published fall 2018 data for a broad example, you know, back in fall 2018, the, do the total daily capacity was just under, you know, 500,000 hogs a day. And as you look at it, there's um, about 30 premises that do, you know, the um, a huge amount of the actual processing. And more specifically, if you take the top 10 establishments back in fall of 2018, those top 10 establishments are um, harvesting and um, about 200,000 per you know, head a day. So, you know, if your daily capacity is about 500,000 a day and your top 10 establishments are doing 200,000 a day, if those 10 plants stop processing, then that would be 40% of your daily processing loss. The other thing, key thing to think about here is that on a, on a weekly rolling basis, again, this was back in the fall of 2018. I'm not going to, I have to rely upon their data for 2020, but my guess is it's the same, maybe even higher, but approximately the same. You know, on a weekly 5.4 days, you know, the, the country is processing over two, you know, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8 million pigs a week, every 5.4 day. So if we have an ASF detection and we have slaughter plants that are becoming infected, if there's an infected pig found in Larage, are we going to shut that thing down for six months? Well, what lessons did we learn from COVID-19? If you, if you, if what, 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 what situation were we in when we started to lose 20, 30, 40 percent of daily slaughter capacity in this country? We were in a situation where the executive branch, the executive branch actually used the Defense Production Act to get the plants going again, because that's how dire the situation was. And, you know, the COVID-19 response, I'm not going to argue any of that. I'm just saying that, you know, the lesson learned that we need to take that animal disease in that is that for the number of pigs that are currently on farm in production, that if you have a, if we have a disruption to the processing, whether it's 5%, 10%, 15, 20, you know, we have a significant problem on top of the animal disease problem. That for me is a huge lesson learned from the COVID-19 response. So I think what I'm recommending is that, that, you know, in terms of moving into this exercise and as a template, you know, as you work in this particular slaughter, one slaughter establishment, that we develop site-specific slaughter establishment plans now for biosecurity and risk mitigation for ASF outbreaks. Specifically, I know some of the state of veterinarians and some of the private sector companies are very worried about the lateral transmission of ASF virus on transportation vehicles and fomites back to farm sites. And I think as we evaluate slaughter establishments, we really need to look at each establishment as an individual, not cookie cutter. You know, what can be done to, you know, reduce that risk of lateral disease spread? And some of it will be actually a, a responsibility maybe at the slaughter plant where the pigs are unloaded, loaded, but, you know, a lot of it's going to fall back on the transportation itself. And I think that, you know, we need to evaluate realistically what is the lateral transmission risk. And again, different situations may have different problems. You know, a slaughter plant receiving finishing pigs might have a way different risk than a sow plant, and it may have way different risks than, you know, like an aggregator type situation. So, you know, as we, as we lump and split, we need to have a, a, a keen eye on what the risks are and how we can mitigate them in a cost-effective uh, manage, manage, uh, manage them. 
So I think we need to determine what mitigations are needed, um, if any additional mitigations are needed. To my mind, you know, one of the big risks we talked about is specifically for blood collected um, at slaughter establishments. Um, the um, other thing that we should do is develop site-specific plans for each slaughter establishment to recover quickly if ASF is detected in the establishment. I suggest the goal is to open, reopen slaughter plants quickly. In a large-scale ASF outbreak, we can anticipate ongoing detections of AS-infected pigs, both on production sites, but also in slaughter establishments. FSAS and FDA and other agencies determine food safety risks to humans. I'm saying that, you know, my shop advises that pork that has passed antimortem and postmortem inspections should not be recalled condemned for ASF fire and transmission risks to domestic swine. What I'm saying is that, you know, if folks are have a plan, you know, if we need to work through this. So if you have a detection in a plant, you know, that animal is condemned. What animals do you condemn? You know, in large, fine. But for the meat product that has already been, you know, harvested, processed, fabricated, distributed, you know, are you going to recall meat from a pig that came off that same premises a week prior? I think we really need to think seriously about what the risk is of a, um, um, again, I'm not saying that any animals that, you know, don't pass animal and postmortem inspection, but if, you're, if somebody is banging the drum for recalling things, or the risk of the spread of the meat product to domestic pigs, I think we really need to think hard about what impact that is going to have. How do you feasibil you know, the feasibility of actually implementing it? You know, what you can recall and can't recall, depending on once it's fabricated and why you're doing it. And that may not be an issue, but I know that I've been in some meetings where I've heard some things postulated that I'm like, I'm not quite sure. You know, we need to talk and work through that. Um, the other thing that's just very quickly, I just had some, you know, references here for, you know, all the, the you know, the foreign animal disease preparedness and response. You know, if you're interested in our authorities, anything that you're interested in, I would, you know, refer you to, you know, the USDA information, and that's just quickly here. I know I've gone over my time. Um, sorry, Liz. I just want to thank everybody again um, for participating today and really thank everybody that's taken the time to participate in the exercise in January. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dr. Zach, and thank you to everybody else. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. But I do have the questions that were submitted in the chat, and I will make sure I get them to the people that they were addressed to, and they will get back to you. And with that, that was a great webinar, lots of great information. So thank you again, and I uh, hope you have the great rest of the day. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.